friends, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for joining me today for another interview with David Suit. You may remember him if you watched my previous interview, but for those of you who are unfamiliar, David Suit is actually a near-death experience researcher, and we had a fascinating conversation last time, and I had so many requests to have him back, and a long list of questions that I wanted to ask him myself. David Such is a retired engineer who founded and operated Steps of Hope Outreach, a nonprofit orphanage that served orphanages in Nepal, Mexico, and Haiti from 2003 to 2018. During a painful and chronic physical condition that triggered severe depression, he clicked on a YouTube video about an atheist who died momentarily and saw heaven. This led him on a 14-year journey of research into near-death experiences, including the testimonies of over a thousand people who have died, seen the afterlife, and returned. In this interview, we um, delve into some topics that I've never gotten into before with anybody else, including life on other planets and what other beings who live on other planets look like, extraterrestrials and whether they have good or ill intent, and the unique role of Earth in this galaxy, and the best answer I've heard yet as to why we experience so much suffering here. Without further ado, here's David. His links will be in the description, as well as the previous interview that I had with him. Enjoy. Hello, David. Thank you so much for joining me again today. I'm so excited to have you back here. Our previous interview received such an amazing reception, and I've had so many requests. People want me to ask you this or ask you that and have you back on. So thank you for being willing to do this. Well, it's a pleasure to be back, Melissa, and I've enjoyed talking with some of your subscribers as well who have contacted me, and they seem like a real good group of folks. Yeah, absolutely. So I just have a list of questions here, which I would like to ask you about near-death experiences and different aspects of near-death experiences. And so I guess we'll start with this one. You've read thousands of them, so I'm just curious if there are any interesting near-death experiences that aren't well known that you'd like to share with us? Uh, yes, there are a few. Uh, one of them that really stuck in my mind, uh, a, once in a great while, I'll get people talking about being shown other versions of Earth. Now, our scientists have this multiverse theory, and for those who are not familiar with it, they say there's an infinite number of parallel universes where different things happen, you know, every possibility, you know. Now, how far that goes, I don't know, but I have heard near death experiences talk about being shown alternate versions of Earth. Now, this gets into some pretty uh, weird stuff, right? But it's no stranger than, than it was a thousand years ago, the idea of the Earth going around the sun, moving through space. I mean, that was just a a ridiculously crazy idea to the people back then. So, you know, don't let the idea that it sounds crazy mean that it's not true. So scientists, and this has nothing to do with spirituality. Our scientists believe there's this different versions, you know, potentially multiple versions of the same reality where things are slightly different. Now, near-death experiencers have been shown this. Uh, one guy was shown a version of Earth where the Nazis uh, won World War II. And they even made a television show, I think, about that. And so often in Hollywood, when you get movies, sci-fi or television shows, things like that, human beings, you see, they're connected to the divine, even if they don't know it. And so subconsciously, they're getting these ideas, you know, from the other side of the veil. And I actually think that some of the things like that, you know, like that TV show of the Nazis winning World War II, that, that comes from an alternate reality that people at sub some conscious level are aware of. Uh, another guy was shown a version of Earth where uh, Mohammed died as a child from a childhood disease. And so even though it was present day, this was, I think his near-death experience was about a year and a half ago, it was during COVID, um, the Twin Towers were still up. There had not been that terrorist act. So yeah, uh, it's one of the other near-death experiences that really stands out is a woman who asked about creation and she was taking she was taken to the beginning of time actually before the beginning of time when this universe was created before the big bang and so she was shown 
you know, that, that whole process of the universe being created. And then there was people who were um, taken on very extensive tours of heaven where they saw, you know, giant trees that towered higher than our biggest redwoods and sequoias and, you know, huge lakes and, and rivers and uh, beautiful parks and, you know, things that made our, our most beautiful national parks pale by comparison. So yeah, there's a few testimonies that really stand out in my head. And a lot of these testimonies don't get popularized because the stuff in there is just so strange that people dismiss it, right? They throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, oh, that's a little too crazy. I, I believe in the loving light and the life review and all that stuff, but, you know, alternate versions of earth, uh, yeah, it gets too crazy. But, you know, uh, just because it sounds crazy doesn't mean it's not true. It's, it's just something outside of our paradigm of release. Wow, that, that's fascinating. And it brings up some definitely brings up some questions which possibly we could get to in a little bit here when we talk about the earth and how it fits into the rest of the galaxy um but right now let's continue the train of thought we're on with um seeing strange and different things in near-death experiences you've read some stories where they have seen other planets um, could you share with us a little bit of what those other planets are and what type of life exists on them? Sure. So one of the common questions near-death experiencers ask, and, and I, I will never forget the first time I was reading Howard Storm's book. He was the first ND that I ever heard. And he asked about intelligent life on other planets. And they said, oh yeah, the universe is full of life. And I, I almost fell off my chair, you know, <laughs> but of course it makes sense, right? God's not that wasteful. I mean, the universe is huge. If we were the only life in it, you know, it's way overbuilt. <laughs> so if God's not that wasteful. So yeah, some of the other planets, um, earth is the most difficult planet in our galaxy to incarnate into. And it's, it's one of the most difficult in the entire universe. So a lot of the other planets are just easier and it doesn't mean they're more primitive. They're actually more advanced. So it's just like, uh, you know, a person's getting their driver's license, young kids, 16 years old, getting their driver's license you don't put them in a, in a broken down old car with a lot of problems, they're gonna wreck. So you, you have the best car that's in perfect working condition with great brakes and good steering and, and good safety features, right? So when a soul incarnates into a life, that, yeah, and they're pretty new at doing this, you don't incarnate here on planet Earth, <laughs> it's, it's way too tough. Uh, so they go to other places where the, the beings are advanced. So I've heard about people in car, uh, one woman was shown a planet with intelligent flying beings. And I remember because she said the, there were holes on the side of the building and on the top, but there were, there were no doors at ground level, you know, because they're intelligent flying beings. And there was another guy, he was taken to a planet where the weather was so mild that they didn't have structures. So they didn't have any structures to protect against the weather. They didn't need it. it stayed at a, at a moderate temperature all the time. And uh, they didn't need structures to protect themselves against weather. Uh, there have been people who have seen planets where apparently our planet has a lot of diversity of life. So other species refer to Earth as the living library. So we're sort of like a genetic uh, library, and we have a great diversity of life. Some planets have only two or three dominant species of plants and animals. They're not very interesting. And apparently, there are aliens that travel to vast distances of space just to gaze at the beautiful, you know, great living library of Gaia that we live on. And, and I think because we live here, we just don't, you know, we're so used to its beauty uh, that we don't always recognize it, but it is quite a beautiful place. So yeah, lots of uh, other planets out there there's in our galaxy it's mostly humanoid life so just like the earth has communities of of like people or like cultures uh, the galaxy has has the same thing so in this galaxy it's mostly humanoid so they kind of look like us there's uh all sorts of variations you know there's there's humanoids that look kind of like uh feline you know cats there's some that are lizard-like there's some that are 
that look like the stereotypical gray aliens, but the, a lot of them look like us. A lot of them, if you saw these aliens, you wouldn't know that they weren't human. You would think they were from Earth because they look so similar to us. So yeah, a lot of different uh, planets out there. You know, if you think about how big our galaxy is, uh, hundreds of billions of stars, well, that's, a, that's a lot of potential for a lot of life just in our galaxy alone, which is a pinpoint in our known universe. Do you think that any of these alien races are out to get us or do some type of harm to us like some people think? Or do you think that the majority of them are maybe more advanced than we are? Well, we're really, I mean, human beings like to think that they're, you know, they're on the top of the game, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're not. <laughs> Apparently, we're very low on the totem pole. And we're kind of like the new kids on the block, just developing. So we have a couple hundred years of uh, technology, right? Well, there are species like the Pleiadians who they've had technology for several million years. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, we're the new kids on the block and there have been intergalactic wars, but pretty much, you know, the, a galaxy will mature and they'll realize you know, war is not the way to do things. So they may have disagreements and they may have power struggles, but they don't do it with fighting. So um, most of the species that are kind of watching over us um, and coming by every now and then covertly have good intentions. Um, there are some that sort of have selfish intentions. There are some that sort of view us like we would view a cow or a chicken or something like that, you know, no need to go out and kill us, but we're not that important to them. Our lives are not important, but, but most of them are pretty aware of, you know, our common connectedness, the divine, you know, the connectedness of all living things. And they respect that. And we've got some very powerful alien races that are kind of protecting us. So, and kind of looking over us and making sure, uh, we're not interfered with. So they have a policy generally where they, they don't, you know, it's, I kind of laugh about it because um, <laughs> we're going to be visited someday by the aliens that, that seeded life on this planet. So when a, when a race of, uh, of intelligent beings on a planet ascends and they get to a certain point in their consciousness, you know, they stop fighting each other, they start cooperating, you know, they get peace on the planet then they really get things rolling. Well, their job, their, you know, God's job that he has for them is to seed life on another planet. So a group of beings called the Pleiadians were the ones who seeded life here on this planet. And they're probably going to be the ones to make first public contact. You know, they've been here for a long time. And if you see a UFO, UFO, it's not them. You know, they have camouflage, so they don't, they don't uh, show themselves. Uh, but they have something called the prime directive, right? They're not allowed to interfere with uh, a group of, uh, of humans or beings that, that hasn't made interstellar contact because that could harm the, the natural development of the culture. And then they have things like replicators and they have uh, transporter technology. Well, this is, this is Star Trek, right? <laughs> I'm talking about Star Trek. So they're going to come and, and say this stuff and people are going to be thinking, what? Are they, are they kidding? This is Star Trek. Well, Gene Roddenberry attended a group of Pleiadian trans channelers in the 1950s. I read actual notes from the meetings. They were posted online. And so he didn't get those ideas off the top of his head about the, there's a galactic federation of worlds. <laughs> there's a prime directive and there's transporters and replicators. And yeah, it's going to sound like Star Trek, but it's it's real. <laughs> so yeah, there's lots of different races out there, and near-death experiencers have been shown different planets and different cultures and all sorts of uh, different kinds of beings. Uh, Howard Storm, the first testimony I ever heard in his book, he he asked him, "What do they look like?" And so they teach you by showing you things. So they paraded these images in front of them. And at first were very humanoid and then they looked different and even more different and even more different. And pretty soon it got so weird that he said, okay, that's enough. I don't want to see any more. But they said, well, you haven't even seen a, a fraction of these. And ah, I don't want to see any more. So yeah, the universe is full of life. Galaxies full of life. Amazing. I remember in Howard Storm's book, he talked about how 
many of the other beings who live on different planets do they're so much more evolved than us that they don't uh, take physical sustenance they get their sustenance directly from the spirit world and that that's where we're ultimately heading as well yes i have heard that as well i know that i've heard the pleiadians eat they do eat but they eat a lot less than we do so fascinating yeah i'm not sure exactly what's what's behind that the physics or biology of that but yeah some sort of creation of physical matter from spiritual energy i'm guessing well this would be a good place to talk about the role of the earth so how does earth fit into the galaxy and what is our role at this point in time okay so there are different laws of physics in every galaxy and although i haven't heard this directly from near-death experiencers i believe this to be true that every galaxy is sort of doing a different test so in our galaxy we have a love fear duality now we are the only free will planet in this galaxy you don't need more than one giant cancer research lab on earth okay if you had one big research lab that was researching cures for cancer as soon as they found a cure for this kind of cancer that kind of cancer they share it with everybody else and then everybody learns and benefits from the the research they're doing so earth is kind of like that research lab we are the free will planet where we can choose to live in darkness or choose to live in light and by what we do and by the choices we make and this fear love duality that we're experiencing in these incarnations on earth the entire galaxy is learning from us so in the history of this galaxy no planet sunk so far into darkness and then sprang back up towards the light if they sank as far as we have as as far as we did uh, that was it they would destroy themselves so because we sank further down in the darkness and then we started springing back up towards the light uh, they all are learning from the consciousness um, development just sort of the expansion of consciousness that we're doing with it through this fear love duality they all learn from that without having to go through the pain of dipping down into darkness and having a planet with you know wars and killing and selfishness and all that kind of thing so we have a very important role um, apparently a lot of the intelligent beings in this galaxy thought that you know this dipping so far down in the darkness was reckless that it was dangerous that we were absolutely going to destroy ourselves and they kind of watched in disbelief as we came through now other races are much more even keeled you know they're much more you know very consistent in the way they do things and human beings compared to the rest of the galaxy were very unpredictable so we will do things that baffle them you know one minute it looks like we're headed towards doing some horrible thing or destroying ourselves and all of a sudden we turn around and do a 180 and you know clean up our act in this area or in that so we kind of baffle and surprise we're kind of like the unpredictable child that uh, the babysitter has a headache trying to take care of because you know she never knows what he's going to do next so we're the we're the badly behaved child of the galaxy <laughs> but we are also doing some very impressive things here and you know so many people are having a hard time in these lives well yeah this is this is the the most difficult planet in the entire galaxy to incarnate so of course you're going to have a hard time being here it's it's not an easy thing but what we're doing is we're helping an entire galaxy and that help that we give to the entire galaxy sort of translates into help to the universe and help to the creation process. So we're helping the creation process move forward by what we're doing on this planet. We're a big part of it. And when we're done and we get to the ascension part, you know, first we're going to have peace on earth. That'll be only the first step. Then things will really get moving, right? So once we get past it there's going to be another planet that uh, we probably seed life on and they're going to have the fear love duality they'll be the only free will choice planet in the galaxy and we'll learn from what they're doing and so that process continues so yeah we're in a very special position right now it's a tough job but it's a good one and we're helping the creation process we're all partners with 
divine creator in expanding what we know as creation and all that is. Wow. Okay. So what you've said there just blew my mind and I have never heard that. So I have a couple of follow-up questions. First, you said when you mentioned the fear love duality and how we sunk so far in the darkness and then sprang back that you didn't get that from your death experiences. So could I ask you where you got that information? Because I would like to look into it more and learn more about that myself. Well, I didn't get the original idea. They have verified it. Um, so, okay. so I get my information from three main places. The first is near-death experience testimonies. That's my favorite. Uh, these people are, many of them talk with God or Jesus or many other uh, religious or spiritual figures. Uh, the second is trans-channelers. Trans-channeling is kind of a, an evil word to religious people, but really a lot of religions believe in trans-channeling. They don't call it that, but they do. So yeah. for instance, in Christianity, I was taught that the Bible is the word of God. Well, that me and they know that men wrote it, which means they believe that the person got a message, divine message from God, and they, they directly translated it by writing it out. Okay, so that's what they believe. Well, uh, trans channeling is the same thing, only you're just you're speaking the message. So if you think about the best way to communicate with um, an alien being on another planet, you can't do it through radio waves, they're too slow, but you can do a direct mind to mind communication. So you know, if I'm trying to translate the word quinceanera, which is a Spanish word, there's no translation for that word in English. You have to understand the culture. So trans-channeling basically is, you know, some other being an alien or maybe somebody from the other side of the veil uh, connecting with the human being and using their consciousness so that the, that human being can take the ideas they've been given with their consciousness and explain it to others in a way that's understandable. So I've listened to a lot of trans channelers. And of course, the third place that the information comes from is uh, just my own downloads during meditation, mm -hmm. things like that. So this whole fear, love duality, it's very common. Spiritual gurus, trans channelers, some near-death experiences have talked about it. Um, I've gotten verification from, from various angles, but yeah, it's, it's a fear, love, duality. It's a test of energy that we're in here. I have heard, I don't know if you're familiar with Law of One, but it's a channeled source and it talks about that, like that this is the place you come to make the choice between service to others or service to self. And then yeah. also so many near-death experience accounts will say that earth is the hardest planet that you can go to and but we think it's exciting we come here for the contrast but yet so many people ask me like people who have really suffered like maybe somebody who lives in a war-torn country or somebody who's lost a child like why why would we choose that level of suffering but this, I think what you've given us here is the best answer that I've ever heard. Did you say we've gone lower than any other planet in the galaxy or any other planet that's existed in our galaxy? In our galaxy, yeah. We okay. sunk further in the darkness than any other planet in the galaxy. And, they, and they, the rest of the galaxy was watching in disbelief as we sprung back out into the light. Now we had, we had a lot of help from above. Oh, okay. yeah. We did. We did not do this on our own. We're too messed up to be able to come out of it on our own. So we had a lot of help, both some, from the other side of the veil and from some of our alien friends who kind of looking over us. We had tons of help. So, now, yeah. here's an interesting, again, we didn't talk about this. So if you're not comfortable or prepared, just let me know. But do you think, as somebody who's come from a Christian background, I'm curious if you think that Jesus may have been one of those beings who came to help us, or what's your perspective on that? Okay, so when I asked about Jesus very early on and who he was, I got this image, and it confused me at first. I mean, I got an image of a huge sphere, which represented God, and then the core of this being separated. So now you've got a big sphere with a hollow core, and then you've got the core over here. And they said, that's Jesus, that's the, the two together are sort of God, but he's sort of the core of God. And I believe that Jesus is like um, 
sort of a go-between. He's like the humanities helper, so sort of our advocate. He's the one that works directly with us, the part of God that works directly with us. And he's not like, you know, the religions that portrayed him, you know, strict rules. And if, and if you don't obey, it's an eternal fire and damnation for you. Now, he's, he's very lighthearted, very easygoing. People of near-death experiences said, when you're in the presence of Jesus, it's like, it's like you're the most important person in the whole wide world. It's, you feel like the whole universe, its entire purpose was to make you the best possible child of God that you can be. And he just makes you feel like the most important thing in the whole universe. And you feel like you can say anything to him. It's like talking to your best friend. I and mean, people have told him that he was crazy. Howard Storm called him crazy. You know, when Jesus told him, oh, the cold war's going to end, he goes, oh, no, you're crazy. That's never going to happen. Of course, it happened, right? So uh, he's a, a very funny, laid back, easygoing, extremely wise sort of conduit advocate for human beings. That's my theory about who he is. Now, there was a, a testimony where there were some people in the classroom in heaven and he came to the classroom and uh, gave a little talk. And of course, when he left, people were just in awe, you know, oh my gosh, what amazing. And the instructor said, okay, that man that just came in here, that, that being Jesus, that you're all so in awe of, someday everybody in this class will be at that level. And some of them just know impossibly so oh yes you're going to be there of course you'll probably have grown by that point and be at some other level but um is he the son of god yeah are we sons and daughters well yeah we're all part of the super creation we're a big family and he's a big part i mean he's a huge figure and a huge player um you know so i kind of still believe in in the bible pretty much. I just have a very interpret different interpretation of the things they talk about in the Bible. You know, I, um, there are things like, uh, you know, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So the Christian interpretation of that that I was taught, well, that means if you don't accept Jesus, you're going to hell. Well, that's not what he's saying. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. Well, it seems like he's the liaison that kind of takes us by the hand and leads us towards the light. He's the guide. He's the gatekeeper. And it doesn't mean, you know, you've got to know who he is and accept him. Otherwise, it's eternal hell, fire, and damnation. And there are other parts in the Bible, you know, First uh, Peter chapter 4, verse 8, love covers a multitude of sins, right? First uh, John 4, 7, and 8, uh, let us love one another. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Everyone. And it's pretty clear to me from the religious texts that I see, even in other religions, you know, uh, uh, the prophet Muhammad said, let there be uh, no revenge and, and no violence. Um, Buddha said, you know, let your love, unconditional love shine to all humanity. So all the religions are saying the same thing about, about this love of God. So I just have a different interpretation. I, I'm still, you know, if I had to say what religion I was, I'd I'm probably 50% Christian, maybe 20% Buddhist, and 30% a mixture of others. <laughs> so. I love that. It reminds me of something I heard you say in your interview with Jeff Mara, and I don't want to steal his questions, but I'm just going to read this back because I think it was so good. 